I'm glad to have a chance to speak here. And I'm supposed to kind of wind up all that's being done. But our speakers have been so excellent that I've been asking questions and enjoying the answers. I think this. We've put a chart up on the board. People who listen to this can't see the chart, but we'll get it published one of these days. And the point of the whole chart is to give us an insight into what the Lord has given us in the Word. And we're still trying to meet out the very best parts of it. And I don't claim to know everything. But I know I worked with Otis and I've worked with David on these charts. And there are some things still in there that we're doubtful about. But the important thing is that we know that God has worked with different people in different times, in different ways, for His own glory and for His own purposes. So why don't we let God do the work and we just try to understand it? That's the way I look at it. Now, why did God progress to the Gospel period from the Old Testament? Well, you know what it was. He had predicted there was going to be a great prophet coming way back in Moses' day. And that prophet was the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came to earth, everything changed. So right here, when the Old Testament period runs into the Gospel period, and that's after about oh, a good 400 years it's been quiet. God hadn't really spoken. He stopped speaking at about 400 B.C. But now he's talking again because Jesus Christ is coming to this earth. He's coming to this earth because he's going to do a remarkable work. Why does he come in the form of a man? He comes because as a human being, he can die. As God, he can't. He won't. But as a human being, he can take the problem and die. And when he dies on the cross, what is he really doing? He's overcoming Satan. He's overcoming death. He's becoming the master of all of these things that are so hurtful to the human part beings. And I'm certainly glad of it because I'm one of them. <laughs> and I hope that all of you sense that what Jesus Christ did was a most, most remarkable thing. Now, why would God let himself be so tainted by men? Why would God allow himself to be hurled in, onto that cross and die. He had to. He wanted to demonstrate to men that he was the God of life and death, that he was the one who could conquer everything. But more than that, he wanted human beings also to know that there may be times when they'll be humble too. Let me ask you, do you have to die the way cross the, that Christ died to be one who has been through all these problems? No. But do you have to die? Better believe it. I know I lost my wife four years ago and I missed her. But I know I'll see her again. I lost a daughter. Probably 30 years ago, 35 or more. But I'll see her again too. The Lord does amazing things. My parents I lost too. Back in the 90s, 92 and 97, my mother and father. But I'll see them again, too. You know, I'm so certain of it that there's nothing that can push me off of that point. I know that God is good to every one of his promises. Now, what is one of the most remarkable of promises? Would you go to Jimmy, Jeremiah 31? Chapter 31, verse 31. And the reason I use this is because oftentimes we say, oh, this stuff is all in the Old Testament. That isn't for us. We're supposed to know only what's in the New Testament. Well, I don't feel that way. Some of the most best learning I've gotten has been right here in the Old Testament. At chapter 31 of Jeremiah, it says, Behold, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
Now remember, he had a covenant with them. But as has been explained to you, we're covered under those promises. He's making a new covenant with them. We're going to share in some of the benefits. Not like the covenant which I made in the, with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which is they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now, being a husband is, of course, being one who loves another and wants to provide the greatest good that they can. Once I understand that's what love was, and Otis really taught me the attitude and behavior that shows the greatest love towards the object of the love. Once I got that in my mind, I realized that was far more important than anything else that we like to call love. It isn't sex, it isn't personal attraction, or anything else. It's the willingness to put another person ahead and do what's needed for their good. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them out of the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was an husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And on their heart I will write it. And I sh will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin will I remember no more. Since we're included on those promises, do you think that might happen to us too? I hope you see it that way. I, I sure do. Because I think that God is going to put his new law in our hearts. And we are going to be doing the will of God. Whatever we do, it will always be his will that has to take the time primary place. And I love him for it because I sure, I sure need him very badly in my life. Now, I said that because I found this in this chapter, and I found it in a chapter where it talks about the restoration of Jacob and Israel's mourning turned to joy. Israel went through a lot of difficult times and trials. But God was doing that back in these days. Why, would, why did he make Israel his special people? God's purpose was to keep His name in the world. To keep His name on earth. After all, the earth belonged to Him. When we get to the kingdom, His name is going to be all over the earth. Nobody can escape it. There will be some that try. That's why we know that there's going to be some tares among the seed, among the wheat. But we also know that God's going to train them too. And they're going to have to either <laughs> do as, as ordered or leave the scene. Now, to me, the premillennium, premillennial kingdom, is really the time of God's greatest act of grace for mankind. I hope you see it that way. Our God is a gracious God and has so many wonderful aspects. Today God is acting in grace, but it's in secret. I mean, think about it. Can you talk and understand where God is working for help you? I don't think so. I think in the kingdom we'll be admonished and we'll come to learn about all the wonderful things God worked in His grace in secret to us to aid us, to help us, to move us along. The kingdom of God is a time of worldwide righteousness on earth. And men who will not learn God's just judgments and follow them, those men will be excluded from this earth. It's going to be tough. As a matter of fact, that's why it's going to be, we're going to be there. 
because you're going to be working on an earth where men have to follow the judgments of God as expressed in his law. We are the people who have learned about God's gracious, wonderful works of grace. And we will be expounding the God of every grace to all mankind. It's a, it's a great and wonderful thing that he's doing. But it's something that we don't really fully understand. Because he will then show it to us when that time comes. The premillennial kingdom, which is about 500 years long as I see it now, I believe it's called the day of Christ. Maybe you've heard that terminology. Any doubt about it? Turn with me to Philippians. My favorite, one of the favorite books. Philippians, and in Philippians chapter 1, When we get down to the, the sixth verse, it says, Paul talking to the Philippians. Remember, those were his people who were the first in, in Asia, I mean, in the, in, you know, the first people in the continent of Europe who took on belief in Christ. Remember the Philippian jailer and so forth? He was one who accepted it. That was about 10 years before this book was written, approximately. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, and maybe you have the word, will perfect it or something like that, but that's not what it means. What the word there means, really, will bring it to a full end until the day of Jesus Christ. See, he can't perfect it until. It's not going to be any way. He's going to bring that wonderful work he was doing in Acts to a full end until the day of Jesus Christ, the premillennial kingdom. We're all looking for that. Going on 7, it says, For it's only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have your heart in my heart, both it, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. And there was a lot of Jews in there as well as a lot of Gentiles. Paul worked both. For God is my witness how long I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray that your love may still superabound, really, still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And now we come to another word. So that you may not approve the things that are excellent. That's, that's a bad translation. It really says, so that you may distinguish the things that carry through. And they carry through until, or in order to be sincere and blameless, until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, I think that's very important. Because what he's telling us there is the day of Christ is going to be the day of his work of making himself revealed to mankind in more obvious ways. Now, as we get further on, let's go back to the 59th chapter of the book of Isaiah. It's not that I have the right translation here. I'm going to give it to you, but Incidentally, it's interesting that the book of Isaiah seems to have so much on the kingdom, and the book of Ezekiel, and even Jeremiah, that you would wonder why. Why would God seem to hide these things in this book, this wonderful book called the Bible? But what did he say? You know, It's the honor, of, pardon me, honor of kings, to search out a thing, right? Well, you don't may not be a king, but if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been given the honor to search out a thing. To describe the start of the kingdom in 59.19, it says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord. Are you reading that? 59.19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. 
That's the evil one, that enemy. Most men, this will be the last day, meaning the day of resurrection for mankind, incidentally. That's singular. If you use the singular for last day, eschatos emeros, it means the last day. It means the day of resurrection. It's clearly that. I'm not going to go through all the means of finding it. But in the book of John, well, let's give you one. You have John chapter 11, verse 23. I, do, I use that because using describing this day of resurrection, when Jesus went to raise Lazarus, uh, here we are. When Jesus went to raise Lazarus, uh, he waited too long. And uh, he was given warning that he was sick. And uh, they expected him to come immediately and heal him. So he waited, and then Lazarus died. And in talking with Martha, his sister, uh, she was despondent. Chapter 11, verse 23. And John 11, verse 23. I'll start, I'll read right there just before it. Martha, I'm going back to verse 21. Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he die. That's a promise. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall, it says never die, but I know it doesn't mean never. It means not in relation to the eon. Not in this call, this time of period, the eon, the eon. Of all the things that God's doing, this is the one where he begins to reveal himself, the eon. And he said, do you believe that? And she said, yes, Lord, I love you. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. I hope that all of you, all of you can say the same thing, because our Lord is a very remarkable Lord. Now, the premillennial kingdom in the book of Daniel, and I'm not going to go to it. Daniel 25 gives you the details what's called the 70 weeks of Daniel, 70 weeks of years. 70 times seven, if you multiply it's only 490. Why do I keep saying it's 500 years? Well, you've got to put the, every 50 years there's a, a separate year that the Jewish calendar would put in. It's the Jubilee year. And when you put all the Jubilee years in for 490 years, you've got 500 years, comes out exact. I know. Now, in Isaiah 2.2, 2, we have all learned, although my friends in the previous work were stating the same thing, only stating it from the book of Micah. And I know that this is something that people have said, why does the Bible copy itself? Didn't Micah just copy it? No, no. It was given by God, but it was so important that he wanted to be sure that everybody saw it. Isaiah's work was for the leaders and the prophets and the chief people of Israel. Micah's work was for the common people, written in a way they could understand it. And it goes on in chapter 2 of Micah, I mean of Isaiah, it is 2 in Micah too. Now it will come about in the last day that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. You've got to understand that word mountain is just a figure. It means the governments of the world. And they will be raised above the hills. That's the lesser governments. And all nations will stream to it. And many peoples, that's peoples plural. I notice a lot of people using the King James Version do not understand that peoples can be singular or it can be plural. Peoples plural meaning many of the different nations on the earth will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, 
and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will, here's that word, judge again. That means set the order, set the righteous order if necessary, between the nations, and will render decisions, meaning really he's going to enlighten them for many peoples, plural again. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nation will not lift up sword against nation. Never, at least not again, will they learn war. Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, those are words for the kingdom. Those are wonderful words of life. The important thing, though, is that when we realize that we have a world where the nations are actually coming to God to get their meaning and their ability to, to govern the world, that we, in fact, are having a righteous world. They don't do that today. Even if you look on your money here and it says, In God we trust. They leave the rest off. It says others pay cash. <laughs> That's all I can say. Now, I have to go to Isaiah 57 to get my next thought expounded about. If, I, if it seems like I can't think for myself, I can't. This Bible gives me everything I need. And I'll tell you, I'm not ashamed to say it. The Lord has, has brought me so much joy in the things I found. In Isaiah 57, verse 19, simple words of the Lord. Oh, that's not the one I want. What did I do? 19 and 20. Oh, wait. From the West, men will fear the name of the Lord. That's, I've already given that one. Sorry. And... Let's go on to, from 50, that was, that was really 59. Yes, okay. Back to the verse, chapter 59, we're going on into 60 here, because it says, in, in 59, 21, it says, As for me, and I have capital M in there, because I think that's God speaking, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit, which is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and for the eon. Now that's a val valuable thing. Let's go on. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the people's. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you, and the nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. It seems like God is putting Israel up there like a lighthouse in this world, this dark world. And as a lighthouse, it gives them the leadership to follow. In, in every way, I'm talking about in agriculture and in, in all science and everything else. The Lord is going to be the leader. Lift up, um, verse 4, lift up your eyes round about. They all gather, come together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will, will be carried in their arms. And then you will see and be radiant and your heart will will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea. Now that sea is not talking about the sea. It's talking about the nations of the world. And if you want to go and look at that, someday go to the book of Revelation, read chapter 17, and look carefully. At the end of it, you will see that the sea is nothing but a figure for the nations of this world. And then you will see... The abundance of the sea will be turned to you and the wealth of the nations will come to you. That's Hebrew poetry. The two sections both mean the same thing. Don't try to separate them. Now, 
let's see so much for that pardon me if I take a moment here now by way of comparison go back to Isaiah 40 you're going to say why are you doing this well because the Lord puts a lot of repetition in here seemingly but there each one is a description that gives you something new to look at and he doesn't put this in here haphazardly in Isaiah 40 oh, let's see Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Verse 2, speak for kindly, in verse four, chapter 40, to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth the desert, a highway for our God. What do these things mean? You know, make smooth. Why would you want to make it smooth? In fact, that's why. A lot of these are symbols of making direct contact with the Lord, of going the most direct ways to Him and having Him use the most direct ways to return. It goes on, and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth the desert in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be uplifted and every mountain and hill be made low. Is he talking about mountains and hills? No. He's talking about governments, lesser governments. The valleys are the peoples of the world. Why do you make the mountains lower? Or why do you raise the, the valleys? Our governments today think they rule the world. They don't. What did God say? Or what did David say? He who rules must rule in the fear of God. And our, our governments don't do that today. As a matter of fact, we live in a country where we have a, 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 a yeah, we have laws and our, we have a, a people in a ruling class today who don't believe in the laws, and they're going to change them to their own meaning. They don't understand. They don't understand that the reason for writing the Bill of Rights into the Constitution was to protect us from people like them. And I'm serious about it. The sad part about this whole thing is men seek power. God has the power. And here it comes, and let's go, because he goes on to say in verse 5, Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And a voice calls out, Call out then. And he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass. You see? And the loveliness of it is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. And sadly, that may be putting us down, but he's not. What he's really saying is, we will all die, but we will be raised again. Now, one more point here. I want you to go to Isaiah 45 with me. The Lord has great plans, and he's going to work his way in the kingdom. In fact, if you're at 45, go back in 44. Eh, just a little bit. Go back to, 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 to verse uh, 28. It is I, that's God talking, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And uh, he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Verse 40, first number one of chapter 45, it says, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him, and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. 
I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. And I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through the iron bars. And I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places, in order that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, I have also called you by your name, and I have given you the title of honor, though you have not known me. Can God do that? Can he take someone who didn't know him and still give him a title of honor? Yes, absolutely. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I will gird you through, though my, you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one beside me, the one forming the light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. I had one of my clients once say to me, is, does a God create bad evil? No, he says he does create calamity, though. He sure did for the poor Jews. The reason that I see these things to you is you can see that the Lord has a grand plan here. I'm not going to go into it all, but you know now that Cyrus he is going to be doing some of the things that have to do with rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the people. So if you go back to Isaiah chapter 60 and just read a few more sin. Lift up your eyes, starting with verse 4. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together, then come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. And then you will see and be radiant and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea, that's the countries, will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. The multitudes of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and all those from Sheba will come and they will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news and praises of the Lord. And all the flocks of Cater will gather together in the name Rams of Nebioth, minister to you. They will go up with my acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. The people of the world will come and worship right there in the temple. The temple has a large court for the nations, and it was designed so that the people and the nations could come to God. And we're looking for that happening. Going down to verse 10. And foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, in my favor I have compassion on you. And that's the way God is. He is a very compassionate God. Cyrus will have that responsibility for bringing the wealth of the nations to, his, to Jerusalem. Those nations will go to Jerusalem and will bring more of their valuables with them. And God will show them how to get great produce, even from their agriculture, and live in comfortable foam. And if I had the time, I would go into it, because I have done the study, but I really have to make this shorter. And Isaiah, we've already, I've already read here, the 10 to 12, where it says the foreigners are going to build up your wall. Well, part of it's going to start right there with Cyrus. He's going to act rebuild a good bit of the city of Jerusalem and the temple, the foundations. Now, the gates will always stand open. They will never be shut day or night. So that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations, their kings led in triumphal procession. For the nation or kingdom that will not serve you, meaning Israel, will be utterly ruined. All of these promises are amazing. And they show the concern of the Lord for his people. And become, to all of us, become joint possessors of these promises. To complete my thoughts, our God has given us this insight. It's right here in the Word. Just have to read it. With a little understanding, we realize he's going to do a remarkable work. He's given us insight into his kingdom so that we may know more of what he will do and how our service 
revealing the God of every grace fits into his plans. We are highly privileged, I'm sure. Privileged children of God today who will be sons of God in that future time. Uh, God rates our faith very highly because it speaks well of our desire to serve him and speak his words accurately and with a spirit of service. I've seen that and I'm very pleased with what I've seen today and Nathan knows what I mean. I greet you and as Otis always had said in his tape library, I greet you in the faith and fellowship of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose we are, whom we love and whom we serve. This will dominate our future service and this Bible will remain our direct contact with the Lord even as the Holy Spirit has given us faith to believe in this day and the words to speak in that day. I thank you very much.